Can we be accepting of fear? Can we get okay with feeling afraid? Because as long as we're afraid of feeling fear, for so long do we stay locked into it and identified with it. Fear, like every other emotion, like sadness, like happiness, like joy, like anger, fear is another mind state which arises when the conditions are there. Not I, not self. Impermanent, it arises and passes. Welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. of our Dharma practice is the path of opening. And it's the opening of our bodies, it's the opening of our sense doors, it's the opening of the intellect or the thought process, the opening of emotion, it's the opening of silence. How is it an opening of the body? As we sit and make space through the process of paying attention, of being aware, we find that the energy knots or the tensions which have been stored in the body begin to release. And so it makes possible a freer flow of energy, begin to experience the body not as something solid, but as an energy system, a field of vibration. The sense doors, as you probably have noticed, become much more refined. We become much more sensitive to sound and to sight and to smell and taste and bodily sensation. As our minds become less distracted, there's tremendous sensitivity of sense perception. The thought process becomes more clear. Instead of the usual jumble of thoughts in the mind, where a lot is going on that we're not aware of, things begin to sort themselves out. We begin to get a very clear perception of how thoughts arise and pass away, what kinds of thoughts are there. That whole conceptual, intellectual apparatus of the mind becomes increasingly clear and precise. Opening to the emotions, beginning to feel more deeply and more clearly all the different mind states that arise in our unfolding experience. An opening to silence. As Manindraji has mentioned, there are 21 kinds of silence. And so there's much to open to. (laughs) So our path of practice, when rightly understood, is not the practice of the mind reaching out for anything. It's not a reaching out to become. Rather, it's a settling back and opening up to to our own nature, to the Buddha nature. Opening out of that Buddha center, rather than a reaching and a clinging. Understanding that 
provides a kind of balance in the practice which gives tremendous stability to the mind and tremendous confidence. It's not that we have to become something which we're not, but rather we have to settle back into what we are. So there's that quality of settling, relaxing, of opening. What is it that prevents this opening? Opening to the body, opening to emotions, to thoughts, to the sense doors, to the silence. When we investigate and explore this process, both of opening and the difficulties that arise in that, we begin to see that there are some very deeply conditioned fears in the mind. And fear is a limitation. Fear is a contraction. Fear is a pulling back from. It's this fear which is so strongly and deeply conditioned in the mind which hinders or obstructs the opening into each moment. Fear of what? Often this fear of pain. We don't like to feel pain. We're afraid of feeling it. And so we pull back from it. We contract. This fear of insecurity that psychological state of being insecure, not certain. And so the mind covers that with many different strategies. There's a fear of death. For many people, not understanding the process of dying creates a tremendous source of fear or anxiety. When we begin to see and understand how fear is working in the mind, we see that not only is it a limitation and a contraction, but it also has a very powerful role in further conditioning the mind. For example, it's fear of losing what we want or what we have that is a strong conditioning agent for attachment. Why do we hold on so tightly? Why do we cling? Why do we grasp? Out of that fear of losing something, losing what we have. The fear of losing what we have conditions attachment. The fear of getting what we don't want conditions resistance or aversion. When we contemplate some experience coming to us that we don't want to have, the fear of that conditions a strong resistance in the mind. Chuang Tzu, the famous ancient Chinese sage, Taoist sage, said, little fears cause anxiety, and big fears cause panic. So it's a strong force in the mind. It's an elemental force. Working with this fear is absolutely essential in our practice of understanding. That is, coming to understand the nature of fear, how it works, how we get caught in it, the possibility of working with it. The Dharma is the totality of our lives, which means that we take as our practice every element of experience. There's no moment of experience which is outside of Dharma practice. There's a line from one song that 
came out a few years ago, sort of expresses the taking of all of life as being our practice. The line in the song was that some people say that life is strange, but what I'd like to know is compared to what? <laughs> that can be your koan for this week. <laughs> When we're comparing parts of our lives, parts of our lives to something else, we create separation and we pick and we choose. But when we see that life is a totality, then every experience is workable. There is nothing outside of our Dharma practice. Whatever state of body, whatever state of mind arises is eminently workable. And what we're doing in our practice is learning how to work with those experiences which often cause trouble, which cause resistance, which we're afraid of. Fear of physical pain. By now you should probably have become quite intimate with the details of pain and probably have noticed a tremendous relaxation of the mind with regard to it. When when people begin the practice, there's often this tremendous struggle and resistance and pushing away and unwillingness to be uncomfortable. As the mindfulness gets stronger, as the concentration develops, the equanimity is cultivated, we begin to get a sense of openness towards pain, that it's okay to feel uncomfortable. There are some subtle kinds of resistances which you might pay attention to. Subtle ways in which the mind is still manifesting or identifying with the fear. One of these kinds of resistances is when we're looking at pain, being mindful, with an expectation that it should go away. That's the bargaining mind. I'll watch you as long as you leave. That's not acceptance. That's not opening to it. There's still some degree of resistance or pushing against Another way the mind resists, opening to those sensations, is the sidelong glance. It's as if the pain is there, and out of the corner of your mind's eye, you're glancing at it, hoping it will go away. The fear of looking at it directly, looking at it straightforwardly. Be very sensitive to the refinements and subtleties of the resistance. Resistance to pain, the fear of pain, feeds into our desire system as a way of avoiding something unpleasant or something uncomfortable. We then feed and identify with a particular desire which will take us away from it. There were times in my practice when the meditation would become so clear and so sharp, so much rapture and joy, and it felt like enlightenment was going to happen any moment in those kinds of sittings. Then the tea bell would ring. And this awful choice (laughs) would present itself. 
Do I get enlightened? <laughs> or the tea's going to get cold. <laughs> and it was amazing to watch the force and the power of desire, of that fear of the cold tea. <laughs> Be watchful. Be watchful of the mind. It's possible to open to a space where we're not so concerned with being comfortable where that's not the guiding force in our lives anymore. That we're willing to be uncomfortable. And that opens up a whole new space for us. It's a whole new arena of experience. Sometimes you'll have much greater opportunity as the retreat goes on, as the weather begins to turn. Sometimes to go out when it's really cold very cold, arctically cold, you know, and it's like breathing frozen air. And to watch the different patterns, you know, of our mind, the initial resistance, the initial fear, the initial contraction, and then the possibility of opening to that, opening to the intensity of that experience. Learning to recognize and to work with the fear of pain. That it's possible to relax, to go into it, to open to it. More difficult than that. We've worked a lot with pain and for most of you I think the mind has softened and opened to it a great deal. More difficult than working with physical pain is working with psychological or emotional pain. And there's one particular kind of emotional pain, psychological pain, that I'd like to single out tonight because it's rooted to one of the basic aspects of experience. And that is our fear of insecurity our fear of that feeling. For the most part, we don't like feeling insecure. It means there's a fear of not being liked or not being accepted or not being respected, not being noticed. The fear of being judged. It's interesting to observe when this fear of insecurity arises, when we're afraid of being judged, what is it that's going on in the mind then? When we look carefully at that, we begin to see that actually we're judging ourselves. But there are certain states of mind, certain emotions, which are not acceptable, which we don't like, which we're afraid of. Could be the emotions of anger or sadness or worthlessness or self-hatred or boredom or insecurity. All those emotions which we've closed off, which we're not open to feeling, which are not okay. When we're not okay with these feelings, when we're not okay with feeling insecure, what happens? We try to create a safe space. And so we create a self-image of ourselves. We solidify 
that sense of self in a particular image, and this is what we present to ourselves and to other people, it's solid, it's safe, it's secure. But how much energy is required to sustain that image? Tremendous. The fear of insecurity, the fear of feeling certain emotions, keeps us bound to certain habit patterns. We play it safe. We're afraid to take risks. Thinks of the fear of failure. One of Krishnamurti's early disciples and students, the woman who is now teaching, her name, was, her name is Vimala Thakkar, a very wonderful and incisive mind. In the early days, Krishnamurti was urging her to teach, to go out and share with people. She was always very reluctant. Finally, Krishnamurti told her, the reason that you don't want to go out and teach and share this with people is that you're afraid to make mistakes. Afraid to make mistakes. What does that mean? What does that do to our self-image, to that sense of who we are? Is it possible to be open to the whole range, to be open to the vulnerability, to be open to the insecurity? If we can't open to insecurity, we're in big trouble. Because there is no security. (laughs) And so it's really fighting a losing battle which we do over and over and over again. Just imagine somebody who had the power to look into your mind. What would you try to protect? What do you try to cover or to hide? What what part of one's being, right? aren't we open to? What part of one's being are we afraid of? It's an interesting exercise just to imagine somebody sitting in front of you and seeing into your mind. Is it possible to open in that way, to be exposed? There's a tremendous power and a tremendous depth which becomes available to us when we open, when we open in this way. One story which I'd like to share with you was for me a very, um, a very deep experience of this possibility. And it happened at a session with Suzaki Roshi who's a rather fierce old Zen master. And the Sashins are very, they're very rigid, and there's not much space to escape, and it's very formal. And unlike this week, there's somebody walking around with a stick to hit you if you, you know, are slumping over or falling asleep. So there's a lot, it's very tight, tight ship. And he works with koans. He gives you a koan. And you're supposed to go see him four times a day and give him an answer. So he gives me this koan. And I go in and I do my bows. And he asks for the koan and I say it. And I give the answer. He says, oh, very stupid. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That was the interview. <laughs> go out. (laughs) Thank you very much. (laughs) Sitting, a few hours later, go in for another, it's called San Zen, another interview. Say the koan, give my answer. Mm, Too much ego. (laughs) He rings his bell. 
This went on and on for two or three days, four times a day, I'm going in. And he has an amazing capacity to to manifest the range of attitudes. In this case, it was an attitude of total and complete dismissal. And each time I go in, too much self, too much ego, too stupid, and I'm getting more and more tense, more and more nervous, more and more uptight, until I could hardly move. Finally, I go in at the third day, and I had just given up. You know, I had gone through the thought pattern. I'm a Vipassana student, and this Zen stuff, uh, it's not really what the Buddha taught anyway. <laughs> I'm going back to Barry. <laughs> so I go in and I just shrug my shoulders in total, total giving up. So what he did was, very skillfully, he gave me an easier koan. <laughs> However, the koan that he gave me, which was, how do you manifest Buddha nature while chanting a sutra, which seemed very obvious and very clear, happened to touch a conditioning that went as far back in me as my third grade singing teacher who told me to mouth the words. <laughs> and since then, there's been this battle so just this incredible fear arose in me, way out of proportion to the actual situation, although not at all out of proportion to the depth of my conditioning. And so it's getting close to the time of having to go in, and I'm getting more and more uptight that I'm going to have to go and sit in front of him and chant for him. I was rehearsing a million times in my setting. I was going over and over again, you know, this few syllables of a Japanese chant. Finally, I go in. I was so filled with anxiety by the time the bell rang for these interviews. Go in and do my bows. We exchange the little formality. I start chanting. The third syllable I got all wrong. The fourth and fifth, completely forgot. I was in this state of total, feeling totally exposed and raw and inside out and uptight and nervous and fearful. It was an amazing experience of vulnerability. I just felt totally totally exposed and terrible. And in that moment of complete rawness, he looked at me and it's as if in that moment he became the Bodhisattva Kuan Yin, the Bodhisattva of compassion. He looked at me and he said, oh, very good. And it was so amazing because those words touched my heart so directly because of that openness, because of the vulnerability. Those words, that love, that compassion was actually able to enter. And so as difficult as the situation was, it also was a tremendous lesson in the value of allowing ourselves to open in that way to allow ourselves to feel exposed and to feel fearful and to feel vulnerable and insecure. Because in that, we're not clinging, we're not protecting, we're not defending anything. It's as if our heart can open and our heart can be touched at that time by anything, by a word, by a sound, by a gesture. So this tremendous power in that place of insecurity that we're so afraid of.
this fear of pain, this fear of insecurity, fear of different emotions. There's the fear of death. For many people with a strong attachment to this mind and body, there's tremendous anxiety about dying. And that fear of death has, it comes from not understanding in a deep, in a deep and powerful way, the impermanency of each moment. You will see that as the practice goes on, as the practice deepens, as the refinement into impermanence, increases, we begin to experience actually, not metaphorically, we begin to actually experience the birth and death of each moment. Each thought is born and dies. Each sound is born and dies. That's a whole different experience. It's a whole different attitude. When we see that, not know it intellectually, because that intellectual understanding does not affect the transformation of the mind. But when we experience that level of momentariness of phenomena, momentariness of consciousness, we then don't hold on so tightly, not grasping so tightly at maintaining some sense of self, some sense of I, We begin to decondition this fear of death, fear of dying. I'd like to read something from Krishnamurti, who expresses very clearly what this practice of dying is about. He says, most of us are frightened of dying because we don't know what it means to live. We don't know how to live, therefore we don't know how to die. As long as we are frightened of life, we shall be frightened of death. The person who is not frightened of life is not frightened of being completely insecure, for they understand that inwardly, Psychologically, there is no security. And when there is no security, there is an endless movement. And then life and death are the same. If you die to everything you know, including your family, your memory, everything you have felt, then death is a purification and a rejuvenating process. To find out actually what takes place when you die, you must die. You must die inwardly to things you have cherished and to things you are bitter about. If you have died to one of your pleasures, the smallest or the greatest, naturally, without any enforcement or argument, then you will know what it means to die. To die is to have a mind that is completely empty of itself, empty of its daily longings, pleasures, and agonies. When there is death, there is something totally new. Freedom from the known is death, and then you are living. To know what it means to die, you must actually die. 
What does this mean in terms of our practice? It means that we cannot hold on to anything. There's one experience that I had in the years of my practice which I'd like to share with you because it took me a very long time to learn a certain lesson. And perhaps it need not take you so long. There was one time as I was sitting where everything opened up and there was a body of light and openness every time I sat would sit and dissolve into this blissful light. And it was wonderful. It was blissful. It was terrific. And I thought, aha, finally, this is it. This lasted for months. Then I went home, came home to America, spent a few months, went back to India, and I couldn't wait to get back to my body of light. Somewhere along the line, there was this little alchemy that took place. And by the time I got back to resume my intensive practice, this body of light had become a body of steel. And I sat down, and there was so much tightness and so much tension and so much holding And for two years, I was practicing in order to get something back. I was practicing in order to re-experience that wonderful, (coughs) blissful light. It was a time of tremendous struggle and tremendous frustration. And it took all that time for me to finally be able to die to that experience, to let it go. That the practice is not to recreate anything. It's as if this process of mind and body is a continual unfolding in each moment to the unknown. And it's never to try to recreate anything. Because what's happened in the past, in a very real sense, is dead. But what we do, and what I did for so long, was to drag this corpse around. (coughs) I dragged this corpse for two years. Can we die totally and completely and fully in every moment? To actually open up to the unknown that's continually arising without anticipation, without expectation, without trying to recreate anything. Because anything that we expect or anticipate deadens our experience. To die completely in each moment is actually to be born completely in each moment. To have this sense, this tremendously creative sense of this process of the mind and body. But it means seeing our fears looking into what we're afraid of that makes us hold on and makes us be attached and try to solidify certain images of ourselves, certain experiences of ourselves, to surrender to surrender the fear. How to work with the fears? They're very deeply conditioned in the mind. They're not trifling mind states. The fears that we have go very deep. Fear of pain, fear of insecurity, 
fear of certain emotions, fear of dying, fear of letting go, fear of the unknown, fear of silence. How can we work with them? How can we incorporate fear itself into our practice? The foundation for working with fear is giving it its due respect. That is, it's not sufficient to play with it intellectually. It doesn't touch the depths of the conditioning. So we have to respect the power of it. And the way we work with fear when it arises, as we work with everything else, is to learn to recognize it just as it's arising in the mind. Some experience happens. It may be experience internally when we're sitting. It may be an experience externally, being, being outside and something happens and a sudden fear arises. Can we notice the fear just as it's coming and be accepting of it? Can we be accepting of fear? Can we get okay with feeling afraid? Because as long as we're afraid of feeling fear, for so long do we stay locked into it and identified with it. Fear, like every other emotion, like sadness, like happiness, like joy, like anger, Fear is another mind state which arises when the conditions are there. Not I, not self. Impermanent. It arises and passes. Is it possible to actually settle back and open to the experience of fear? To feel the physical sensations, to feel the mental coloring, to see the images that are passing through, to to be aware of the thoughts, the fearful thoughts that are there. An image which you might work with when fear comes up in terms of relating to it is of how you would relate to a frightened child. Suppose you saw a young child who was very frightened. How would you relate to that child? Probably, you would go and be supportive and be loving. You probably wouldn't get into it and, and you know, encourage the fear. Yeah, you really should be frightened. Nor would you be condemning it. You know, terrible. You know, this, this is terrible. Get lost. Neither way. You wouldn't be feeding it and you wouldn't be rejecting it. But rather, there would be a sense, I think, of tremendous support and tremendous space with no demands. Just being there for that child. Being there in a loving, supportive way. Can we do that for ourselves? When fear arises, not wallowing in it and identifying with it and not rejecting it, but simply to open to the feeling to see that it's okay to feel fear. Once we get okay with the feeling, when we're not afraid of that feeling, then we can apply some discriminating wisdom. And in some situations, fear arises, and it's a challenge to us. Can we act despite the fear? And at other times, the discriminating wisdom applied at that time will will suggest a timely retreat from action. Doesn't mean, mindfulness of fear doesn't mean that we charge in recklessly to a situation, but rather we're okay, we're balanced enough with the feeling so that we can see, we can determine, we can reflect on what action, what what kind of response is the most appropriate.
in a retreat, although you might not think there are so many opportunities to play with the edge of fear, there are many. Working with how much you sleep. Most of us have a strong attachment to sleep. And when there's a suggestion to cut down drastically, see what arises. Cutting back on food. Thought of missing the banana at tea. Fear might arise. Going out into the woods at night. Beautiful. The tigers. There are many opportunities to work with this edge. It's worth working with because it's exactly the fear which is our limitation. The Buddha is known as the fearless one. And there is that sense of wonderful freedom. The sense, we can get the sense of it as we begin to understand how it's possible to work with fear, to open to it. Another way to work with it, especially when it's very strong and dominating, is to cultivate metta. Loving kindness is the antidote to fear. And the Buddha suggested it particularly for those people who were practicing in the forest and were um, confronted by all kinds of demons and ghouls and whatever. So the cultivation of goodwill, of loving kindness, you have to be a little careful with this one though. Like sometimes you can think that you're cultivating loving kindness and it's actually not loving kindness at all. A few years ago, I was visiting Sharon in her house in Western Mass. I was walking down this road. I passed the house with these two little dogs. They were, they were quite little, but, but also very ill-tempered. Really yapping in a hostile way. So I'm walking down the road, minding my own business, coming across these dogs. I have this wonderful idea, well, I'll just send them metta. And these dogs are being a little ferocious, and I'm standing there, be happy, be happy, be happy. One of them came and bit me. (laughs) And it was immediate feedback. (laughs) Manipulative meta <laughs> is not meta. And so it's important, especially when we're using it as an antidote to fear, that we actually drop into the space of real loving kindness, not as a weapon. Another interesting way of working with fear is really penetrating very deeply into the nature, the nature of the mind and the nature of experience. All is mind made. It is like a person painting a tiger. They paint it, look at it, and are frightened. There is, however, nothing at all in the painted figure itself which is fearsome. All is the brushwork of your own imagination. That's true on very many levels. You see how it's true just in sitting. If you ever have a sitting and get lost in a thought or fantasy or daydream, 
and so lost in it that it actually evokes emotions. You know, we're, we're lost in a scenario and then feeling angry or happy or sad or fearful. What's going on? It's just the brushwork of our own imagination. We're painting a tiger on the wall and then looking at it and getting frightened. On a deeper and more subtle level, you know, as you're confronting the tiger, the idea of self, the idea of owning this body and mind is another brush stroke of our imagination, although one that's a little more difficult to say. As we go into the nature of our minds, we see that there's no need to hold on to anything. Working with fear, getting okay with it, allowing ourselves to feel it, and then sometimes moving in spite of it, seeing that we can act even though fear is there, sometimes seeing the wise thing is not to act, is not to respond. Keeping a sense of humor. Do you have any questions about working with fear, kinds of fears that arise in practice? You should practice quite diligently working with fear, because Halloween is coming up. It's hard to learn how to watch it. Um, so I watch the sensation of it and try to see what I'm feeling and so on. In order to really investigate it fully, I'm just wondering how do you sustain that? You know, because it's serious and it's a fact that you're also willing to, to, find, to go further and maybe never go. How do you sustain that investigation? What you described sounds exactly right. When fear comes, to go into the awareness of the sensations, which are the most tangible, usually the, the sensations of fear are very noticeable. You, know, and you, can, you can feel them quite strongly in the body. That's a very good handle on being mindful of it because it's so tangible. Watch your relationship to those sensations. In other words, is there, is there a sense of openness to them? Or is there a sense of resisting them? Right. As you get settled in the awareness of the sensations, then pay attention to the other components of it. For example, are there particular images which are coming through the mind, or particular thoughts coming through the mind? And the most subtle aspect, true not only of fear, but of other emotions as well, It's like the color tone of the emotion. It's not the physical sensation, it's actually the mind, the mind feeling of it. But there's nothing tangible there, although it can be very strong and we can become aware of it. So each emotion has its own color tone, is the closest image I can think of to describe an actual quality that's not tangible. The, the images can create the color tone or can be a manifestation of it. You know, so it's really dissecting it. We take this experience, which we call fear, and we dissect all the components. The physical sensations, the images, the thoughts, 
the mind feeling, with the sensations as the base, because that's the most tangible and the most, the easiest to actually open to. I have this fear of going crazy. Sometimes when I feel like there's this nice moment of real opening, get to the edge. And I think, oh, okay, now it's, it's, it's going to be great or you're going to go nuts. And so, can you say something about trusting, or developing trust for the unknown at the moment like that? Fear of going crazy. In that context, what does going crazy mean? Good. Go crazy. Because there's no control anyway. Not to respond too flippantly, because the question is actually... uh, an important one. There are people who lose it. However, we keep an eye out. (laughs) And we'll let you know (laughs) if you're one of them. (laughs) For the most part, go with it. You said that uh, fear conditions attachment. Um, I'm interested in what's the cause of fear. Um, is it, doesn't it work the other way around? Also, isn't fear rooted in, in attachment? Yeah, I think I think it works both ways. You know, if there's strong attachment, then the attachment conditions the fear of losing. Um, wait, wait, before you go on, what's your relationship to the feeling? Well, I was actually, the question you wrote is I was exploring my relationship to it because I was, I'm feeling that I'm letting it be in my body and exploring it. And I also don't necessarily feel like acting despite the fear, it's something that arises naturally. I have to decide to play the edge, right. or that's a decision right. that you suggested, it has to do with my question. Um, I mean, just exploring it isn't making me pull away. That's okay. And it's also not making me act. And the whole idea of playing the edge of something is not just this environment where it's not it. And I'm... Um, It, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by that idea uh, as we've been met in my own practice, playing the edge. And I guess I, is that generally applicable to many things? I mean, I mean, I okay. Yeah. Playing the edge in practice. It's true that at that time, often it's necessary to summon up a quality of determination and a quality of resolve. This this resoluteness of mind um, to do something even though there may be fear as a way of going through or breaking past it. I would say that one of the most important balancing factors in doing that, and it's important to stay balanced, 
is that that resolution or determination to do it comes because you want to do it, not because you have an idea that you should do it. And then, for example, you're sitting with a lot of pain. There are two different ways of working with that. You could determine, I'm going to sit with this because good yogis are supposed to sit with it, and I know that I should, and not want to be sitting with it at all. So all that's created there is a tension and a struggle. You know, at best, it's endurance. Another possibility, and in that case, it would be better to move. It would be better to change. Another possibility is sitting there with that pain, and the conditions are right. The mind is taking interest in exploring it. Okay, let me see what happens. Thank you.